Welcome to the Williamson County EMS Stop the Bleed program in our hemorrhage control course. I am Stacy Henricks, one of our Stop the Bleed instructors. The original Stop the Bleed course was developed after the 2012 shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary. The White House and the Department of Homeland Security created this program with input from all these organizations. So when something like this happens, you will be prepared and can possibly save someone's life. In this course, you will learn scene safety and awareness, recognize life-threatening bleeding, the appropriate interventions for bleed control, and applications of bleeding control techniques. The leading cause of preventable death after injury is bleeding. If we can control the bleed, then we can increase the chance of survival. We talk a lot about mass shootings, but we are more likely to have severe bleeding from other causes. Places like our own home, schools, roads, we have many tools in our homes, like lawn mowers, saws, and knives that can cause a life-threatening bleed. Schools have wood shop, automotive, and culinary arts that use tools that can cause injury. There are car accidents with broken glass and cut metal that you or someone else can cut themselves, causing a life-threatening bleed. These are just a few we may not think of right away when we think of a life-threatening bleed, and there are many more. Mikey the Moose here will help us through our algorithm of help. First, call for help. Make sure the scene is safe. Grab some gloves, which should be in your trauma kit, and then find the bleed. First, call 911. You want to get help moving towards you as soon as possible because the average time of EMS to arrive anywhere is between six to 10 minutes. So you don't wanna to wait to call help. Next, your safety is number one. You have to think about yourself first and staying safe. You can't help somebody if you are injured next to them. So make sure the scene is safe. If your scene is not safe or becomes unsafe, move to safety, taking the injured person with you if you can. Most people are worried about getting blood on them or catching a disease. And really, if your skin is intact and touching their blood, even if you have a cut on your hand or arm and touch their blood, you have a low chance of catching something. You should wear gloves if possible. If you get blood on your skin, the best thing to do after help has arrived is to wash the area with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Then contact your primary care doctor to let them know you are possibly exposed to blood. Basic anatomy. We have different blood vessels throughout our body that can bleed. You can have a life-threatening bleed from any of these blood vessels. Arteries have the spurting blood everyone thinks of when you think of a life-threatening bleed. Veins have a slower but steady flow which can end up being a life-threatening bleed. Finally, capillaries are small and have a slow bleed, but you can still have a life-threatening bleed with capillaries. We have about five liters of blood in our body. Once we begin to lose one to two liters, it becomes serious. And if we lose three liters, the risk of death increases. It takes about two to three minutes for someone to bleed out from a life-threatening bleed. And remember, it takes the average six to 10 minutes for EMS to arrive. This is why it's extremely important for you to learn these skills so you could possibly save someone's life from a preventable death. The following images are graphic, but they are people with fake injuries and fake blood. One image also contains pillows in jeans and is not a real amputation. If you do not like the sight of blood, you may want to look away. Let's go over what is considered a life-threatening bleed. If you have spurting blood that is coming out of a wound, that is a life-threatening bleed. Blood that is pooling on the ground. This means any large pooling of blood on the ground is a big deal. Any clothes that become saturated and soaked with blood is a bad bleed. Bleeding in a victim that becomes confused or unconscious meaning if you are talking to them normally and now they're acting differently, or if they go unconscious, it's a life-threatening bleed. Any part of the arm or leg that has become severed is a life-threatening bleed, except when it is amputated finger or toes. Those can be controlled with direct pressure. Lastly, any blood you see and you think, oh my gosh, that's a lot of blood, that is a life-threatening bleed and we need to do something about it. Back to Mikey the Moose to go through the algorithm. Is there a life-threatening bleed? No, there isn't. We will begin by applying direct pressure and getting a trauma kit. To apply direct pressure, you want to use your hands or gauze to apply firm pressure with the heel of your hand directly over the injured area. 
If you do not have clean gauze, you can use a dish towel, your shirt, or even that dirty gym towel you have in your bag. The person will get antibiotics and wound cleaning at the hospital. When applying direct pressure, do not remove any gauze if it becomes soaked with blood. Just add more gauze and pressure. Also, do not peek. Do not lift the gauze to check if the bleeding has stopped. Doing so may cause you to pull away any clots that have started to form, and bleeding will continue and might even take longer for the clotting to start again. Once you have done direct pressure, you may use a pressure bandage to wrap the area. Application of direct pressure and pressure bandages will be covered in the skills video. Hello, my name is Matt Biasotti and I serve as a training captain for Williamson County EMS. When assessing for injuries like the ones noted on our friend here, Mikey the Moose, start by searching for life-threatening ones such as major bleeding. If major bleeding is noted on your patient, you should apply firm direct pressure to the wound as previously described and retrieve a trauma kit if available. Is the major bleed located on an arm or a leg? If so, locate and apply a tourniquet. Here's a list of guidelines to consider when applying a tourniquet. At a minimum, tourniquets should be placed two to three inches above the wound. We advocate placing them high to survive. What we mean by this is that you should place them high up on the wounded extremity. The reason behind this is simple. Placing the tourniquet high ensures the pressure applied during application compresses the vessel against a bone. The upper portion of your extremities are comprised of a single bone, whereas the lower portions are comprised of two bones, thus potentially causing complications during the application as a severed vessel may lie between the bones. A second reason for this is that your vessels have muscle tone and are pulled tight like a rubber band. Upon injury, they may retract up further into the extremity. Lastly, regarding placement location, it is not always readily apparent exactly where the wound is located on the injured extremity. For example, if someone suffers a gunshot wound near the elbow, the bullet may impact the bone and deflect higher up into the arm prior to exit. Now that we have discussed proper placement, let's review the other tourniquet guidelines. Tourniquets may be applied over clothing. Because we are placing them high on the extremity, we need to ensure that any potential harmful items that are in the pockets are removed. Things such as keys, pens, or pocket knives should be removed. You should tighten the tourniquet until the bleeding stops. Tourniquets may induce a painful response from the patient. Please know this does not indicate an improper application. Reassure your patient that the tourniquet is necessary to save their life. Commercially developed tourniquets are designed for rapid application. Tourniquets should be applied in 20 seconds or less. More than one tourniquet may be required to stop the bleeding, especially on lower extremities because we have large muscle mass and structures. Upon successful application, make note of the time. This is important because it potentially affects patient care downstream. If you have ever heard the adage that tourniquet application causes limb amputation, this is simply not the case in our modern society with most people having access to healthcare facilities. On the other hand, if you're out in a remote setting and healthcare is hours away, this would be the time to consider life or limb. There's a lot of data available regarding tourniquet applications during the recent combat campaigns in Iraq and Afghanistan. Soldiers have had documented cases of having tourniquets applied for several hours with minimal side effects and no applications having been directly linked to causing limb amputation. Speaking of tourniquets, the tourniquets pictured here are the ones that have been through rigorous testing and research and have received approval from the Committee on Tactical Combat Casualty Care, commonly known as TCCC. The committee evaluates the research and application of commercially available tourniquets and makes recommendations based on several important factors. Ease of self-application, material width, and mechanism for mechanical tightening such as a windlass rod or ratcheting system. Note the gold star that is placed on the CAT tourniquet. It was one of the first tourniquets to receive committee approval and has a patented system to provide circumferential pressure. More details on that to come. Although these tourniquets pictured here do not have committee approval, they can still be effectively used as a tourniquet and have their own individual benefits. The RATS tourniquet is small and can easily be stored or carried. Pressure is achieved by continually wrapping the tourniquet around the limb and pulling pressure as you go. Same for the SWAT tourniquet. The benefits of the stretch wrap and tuck tourniquet is it is multiple uses. It can be utilized as a pressure bandage, occlusive dressing, or as a tourniquet. 
These tourniquets can also easily fit limbs of all sizes, something the others can have difficulty with. Because CAT tourniquets are the industry gold standard, we will focus the program on teaching to their use. Let us discuss the components of a CAT tourniquet as pictured in the slide. Number one is the friction buckle. This is where the band of the tourniquet is routed through during the application. Number two is the windlass rod. This is where the pressure is developed by twisting the rod. Typically two or three turns, but most importantly until the bleeding stops. Number three, the circumferential band. This band runs through the windlass and is affixed at both ends of the tourniquet. This band is encased by the outer self-adhering band. Remember the part I said earlier about the patent? That is what separates this tourniquet from all the others and provides a circumferential tightening. Number four is the windlass clip. This is where the windlass is secured after twisting. Number five is the windlass securing strap. This strap is placed over the windlass clip as a secondary safety to ensure the windlass does not come loose from the clip. And lastly, the self-adhering band is just as the name describes, the outer Velcro strapping that secures onto itself. Tourniquet application in children. Tourniquets can be applied to children just as in adults. The challenge sometimes arises based on the limb circumference. Young children have smaller arms and some tourniquets can only go so small because of the plastic plate that the windlass attaches to. If you have concerns about the limb circumference, you can remedy this by placing bulky dressing around the limb and then placing the tourniquet on top of that as seen in the picture on the slide. Back to Mikey the Moose algorithm. Is there life-threatening bleeding? If so, apply direct pressure and get the trauma kit. If the wound location is in a junctional area, such as the neck, pelvis, or armpit, these areas are too high for the tourniquet and wound packing would be required. Let's discuss this a bit further. Wound packing is primarily utilized to control life-threatening compressible hemorrhage that is not amenable to tourniquet application. Again, the target areas are those at the junction, where the limb meets the torso. Hemostatic gauze is a preferred product for this technique because of its rapid promotion of coagulation. However, if it's not readily available, you may use regular gauze, roll gauze, t-shirts, towels, etc. The difference between these items is how quickly and effectively they can work. Hemostatic gauze, such as quick clot, is impregnated with kaolin. Other types, such as cellox or chida gauze, are impregnated with chitosan. All of these products work along the body's clotting cascade and help to promote coagulation. In years past, the gauze that contained chitosan had concerns for causing allergic reactions because chitosan is extracted from crustaceans such as shellfish. This issue has been resolved by isolating and removing those proteins, so the product now only has coagulation properties without the concern for the allergic reaction. Let's now talk very briefly about how you would apply wound packing. Unlike tourniquets, you must first expose the wound to visualize the area that you will be packing. Once exposed, you will insert your fingers carefully into the wound cavity. A couple of important notes for this part. This will be painful for the patient and the patient should be reassured that this is necessary to save their life. As a provider, we need to be mindful that the wound may contain sharp bone edges or objects that may hurt us. Insert your fingers in a deliberate but controlled fashion. You must feel the bordering tissue to ensure this is a packable wound. If you feel no wound borders, this means you are either in the chest cavity or the abdominal cavity and cannot pack these areas. Once we have located the severed vessel, begin by introducing the hemostatic gauze. You will pack the void until the entire cavity is filled with gauze and protruding outward. Once this occurs, place firm direct pressure for several minutes or until help arrives. Lastly, if during your attempt to wound pack, you are unable to locate the source of bleeding, you may try a technique known as blind wound packing. This is accomplished by placing gauze inside the wound in multiple directions until the cavity is filled with gauze. This is not an ideal solution and is not as effective as packing directly to the source. Hi, my name is Jim Parsons with Williamson County EMS. Let's continue on with our Stop the Bleed training by returning to Mikey the Moose and our algorithm for helping. We look for life-threatening bleeding and this time our bleeding is coming from an open wound to the chest. How are we going to treat this? Air should get into the chest, into the lungs, through the mouth or the nose, not through a hole in the chest wall. If air is able to get into the chest through the wound, it is possible that it could collapse the lung. 
This is a true life-threatening emergency. As the immediate rescuer, you can take actions to prevent air from entering the chest. This could be as simple as placing your gloved hand over the wound or by application of a chest seal. Ideally, a chest seal should be applied by a medical professional, but if one is not there, you can act. For our purposes, we will consider the wound as a chest wound if the location is between the navel and the base of the neck. Chest seals are simple barrier devices that prevent air from moving through them. When placed over the wound, air can no longer pass through into the chest. If you have one available, a commercially made chest seal is best. Commercially made chest seals may be vented or non-vented, and we'll state that on the packaging. A vented seal will allow air to leave the chest cavity, but will not allow air to enter the chest cavity. If you use a vented seal, it should always be on the top side wound, and the unvented seal would then be used on the downside. If you do not have a commercially made seal, you can improvise and create an effective one with readily available material like plastic wrap, aluminum foil, plastic baggies, anything that is non-permeable and will not allow air to pass through it. To apply a commercially made chest seal, follow these simple steps. Locate the wound or wounds. If you find one chest wound, always look for others on the front, the sides, and the back. Quickly wipe away blood and dry the area. This does not have to be perfectly dry, but a quick wipe. Take the seal out of the packaging and remove the protective covering over the adhesive. Center the seal over the wound and gently press down to seal the adhesive to the chest. Repeat this for the other chest wounds if you found any. If you do not have a commercially available chest seal, you can improvise with those other materials you may have. Cover the wound completely with whatever you are using as a seal. Gently press the material to the chest and secure the seal with tape or just hold it with your hand. After a chest seal is applied, the patient should be monitored for signs of increased difficulty breathing. If you place a chest seal on a person with a chest wound, this information must be communicated to the emergency responders. So what is next after we control the bleeding? Shock is a very real concern in someone with life-threatening bleeding and there is something simple that you can do to help. Cover the patient with a blanket. The signs and symptoms of shock may be subtle or they may be obvious. If you have a patient with life-threatening bleeding, any of these signs should be considered as a warning that your patient might be going into shock. A patient that has altered consciousness, or maybe your patient was talking with you just fine a minute ago, but is now confused or slow to respond, or has even gone unconscious. Maybe your patient is getting thirsty, or restless, or irritable. Is their skin pale or sweaty? Is it cool or cold to touch? When you look at their face, do their lips appear blue? What about the skin under their fingernails? Does it appear blue? This blue color can indicate that oxygen is not getting to all parts of the body. If you know how to check a pulse, do you find it really fast and weak? Is there rapid breathing? Is your patient nauseated? All of these signs can indicate your patient is going into shock. As I mentioned earlier, the best thing that you can do to treat for shock before EMS arrives is to keep the patient warm. Use of an emergency blanket, any other type of blanket, or even a coat can help prevent the loss of body heat. Why is this even important? Keeping it simple, the body systems work best when the body temperature is in a very narrow range. The blood circulating in our bodies helps to maintain that body warmth. As we lose more blood, the body starts to have problems maintaining the heat and our temperature drops. This leads to hypothermia or low body temperature. When we become hypothermic, our blood begins to have difficulty clotting. This is known as coagulopathy. This makes it harder to stop the bleeding, increasing the chances of shock. If we can prevent the body from going into hypothermia, we may reduce the development of shock in your patient. We've covered a lot today, so let's do a quick summary of treatment options for somebody that's bleeding. 
The highlighted patient on this slide is our reference. For life-threatening bleeding from a wound in the green area, the arms and the legs, how would you treat that? These injuries would be best treated with a tourniquet. For wounds in the pink areas, the groin, the armpits, the neck, all areas that a tourniquet cannot be used, the best treatment option would be wound packing. If you have a suspected open chest wound, the blue area, a chest seal would be indicated. After you have managed all the bleeding wounds and sealed the chest, you would manage the patient for shock by covering them with a blanket. Our last encounter with Mikey the Moose today will lead us to discussing some of the important contents for Stop the Bleed kits. The Texas Legislature established guidelines for the contents of bleeding control kits in all public and open enrollment charter schools in the state. The numbers and locations of kits in the schools are left to be established by the school's safety committee or the charter school's executive team. For personal bleeding control kits, the contents are very similar. We recommend that you consider having more than one tourniquet. Although hemostatic gauze is the best option for wound packing, this is an item that is expensive and it comes with an expiration date. That means you'll most likely have to replace it every few years. If you choose not to use the hemostatic gauze, add in extra gauze rolls that can be used for wound packing. You should stock the kit with plenty of gauze pads and gauze rolls. Trauma shears are not expensive. Spend a little bit of extra money, get a good set. When you need to cut through clothes, you want to have the tool to do it quickly. The emergency blanket is inexpensive, it's lightweight, and it takes up very little room. When you are choosing gloves to put in your kit, get the size that fits you best and put in a few extra pair. In closing today, I would like to remind you of something stated early on in this presentation. The number one cause of preventable death after an injury is bleeding. The EMS system, and the patient rely on you, the immediate responder, to begin the life-saving measures in those critical first few minutes. We would like to encourage you to complete your Stop the Bleed training by attending a skill session. In that session, which lasts less than an hour, we will provide live demonstrations of the skills on mannequins and training models. You will then have the opportunity to practice those skills, gaining competency and confidence to perform in the event you are faced with a bleeding emergency. On behalf of Stacy, Matt, and myself, along with Williamson County EMS and our other partners that help with the building of this program, I would like to thank you for being here with us. Music